Now, I challenge you. One word, one word only. That word is prophecy. What is prophecy? What is its purpose? What is its function? You that function and motivate in the realm of prophecy, what is it doing? What is it accomplishing? Prophecy functions in three realms. You should be teaching me. The first round, the gift of prophecy, which we see almost in every church. The gift of prophecy is not the ultimate. No, it's not. It is the beginning. Yeah. Don't let the devil deceive you and to thinking you've got it. It's the beginning. Next, the office work of a prophet. God is looking for people with responsibility. Yes. Amen? And the best is the spirit of prophecy. Okay? I will touch on these as I go along. <clears throat> 1 Corinthians 12, 10. To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. What is a prophet? He's not a fortune teller. He is a foreteller. A prophet sees yesterday, today, and tomorrow. God raised up tremendous prophets. The Bible is filled with them. They did traumatic things. Amen? You can say amen. I'm not in the Baptist church tonight. <laughs> the prophets of God did tremendous things. They left an impact upon the people they spoke to. The prophet spoke and nations changed. Prophet spoke and nations was destroyed. Come on, people. Prophet spoke and for proclaimed cataclysmic disaster, which we are soon to face. Are you with me tonight? Prophecy is not goosebumps and ducky bites and the hair standing up on your arm or your neck. The gift of prophecy is the introduction. Tongues and interpretation are equal to prophecy, but they are not prophecy. Anybody agree with me? Yeah. Many books don't say that. But prophecy is a precarious place to be in. The spirit of the prophet is what? To who? To who? To him as a prophet. Many people say, well, the spirit of the prophet is subjected to the prophets. Yes, but he's subjected to himself. And we've been brainwashed, and we've overlooked it. And 
when you feel good, off you go in prophecy. If you don't feel good, you do nothing. And circumstances, conditions, environments, people, and places have a tendency to govern the gift of prophecy that you are motivating in. Come on now. If you have ears, hear what the Spirit of the Lord is saying to the church. I don't call myself a prophet. I don't call myself anything. I am just what God wants me to be. But I see that there's a dire lack in teaching and instruction in the realm of prophecy. Sister Gibson would take you and take you aside and teach and instruct you to bring that ministry of prophecy into full maturity. A demonstration. In Haiti we say example. If I had a thimble of water and I dumped it on the carpet, you wouldn't even see it. Right? Now if I had a glass of water and dumped it on the carpet, it'd make it a little bit wetter. Now if I had five gallons of water and dumped it on the floor, it'd make a pretty good sized splash. Are you with me? How many trying to, you know what I'm trying to get at? And if I had a 55 gallon barrel and dumped it on this floor, some of us would get wet. Right? And why can't we learn the spiritual maturity in God? God desires that we wait upon our ministry that the vessel will enlarge, enlarge, enlarge. And then when God speaks, beloved, we'll remember what thus saith the Lord. And we've listened to prophecies by the hundreds, and soon as they've left the modulation of their lips, we can't remember one word was said. And we say, Thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord, thus saith the Lord. You don't always have to say, Thus saith the Lord. Hello? Are you still with me tonight? And I've seen many people get up 10, 15, 20, or more times prophesying. I will keep some of my thoughts to myself. I've often said, God, is that you? I'd rather be in a meeting and have God move once and shake everybody from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet and remember and leave an indelible impression upon your heart that you know that God spoke tonight. Samuel never played games with his prophetic ministry. Nathan never played games with his ministry. Jeremiah never played games with his ministry. Elijah never played games with his ministry. He respected it. He revered it. He honored it. Come on now. I don't see where Paul used the gift of prophecy like a yo-yo. On and off, on and off, on and off, on and off. But when he spoke, things began to happen. And God is looking for prophets and prophetesses that when they speak, things will stop, stand still, or take place. Amen. Amen. I only gave you one scripture verse. Perhaps you would like another one. How about 1 Corinthians 13, 2? <laughs> and though I have the gift of prophecy, understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and though I have all 
faith so that I can remove mountains and I don't have compassion, love, and understanding. It means nothing. And I was at a big convention, and this well-known prophet got up and told the congregation, for $20, I will prophesy over you. Would you go up to a man like that? Well, I'll tell you, hundreds went up that night. Hundreds went up that night. How many of you are looking for a word? You don't... Just maybe one or two, raise your hand. I'm not looking for a word. I want the word. A true prophet of God will not give you a word. He'll give you the word of the Lord. And you might not like it. And your first reaction is, that wasn't the Lord. The modulation and the quality of his voice. Oh, no. God speaks in a still, small voice. Oh, I've encountered this as I travel along. But I'm going on. I've seen God speak in a whisper. I've seen God take people and shake them under the anointing of the Holy Ghost because their hearts was hard and their ears was deaf and their eyes was blind. And I'll tell you, God can shake you harder and quicker than a leaf caught in a winter breeze. God is looking for a people that will walk in the integrity of the Spirit and live in the life of Jesus Christ. When we begin to function in that we're going to have true holiness, true ministry, that will tear down the mountains, tear up and destroy and build a habitation of praise. And God is beginning to birth a spirit of travail and cry in the body of Christ. They're looking for the reality of the power of God. God said it. I believe it. And some are beginning to walk in the revelation of it. And God is raising up prophets. Sure, you can speak firm. You can speak with authority. And it can be just filled with love. Because that is what can change lives and hearts. If Samuel didn't love King Saul, he'd have never told him what he did. Come on now. Saul could have said, forget it. Nathan could have said, forget it, but his heart wasn't so tuned with God, and God's heart was broken. So they went and ministered in love. Why? Trying to restore that brother back again. Come on. Come on now. Saul wouldn't pay the price, and David did. And we could go right straight through. Jeremiah was cast in prison, and God, Jeremiah said to God, you lied, man. You lied. You gave me a false prophecy. I was just reading it a little while ago. But you know what? It was 70 years before they got free. Come on. And everybody made fun of him and ridiculed him, but he spoke on the authority of God's word regardless of how he felt. And any two ministry is not governed by your feelings. Come on. Any true ministry of God does not function by your feeling. It functions by the Spirit of God. Amen? So let's get ourselves out of the way. Our feelings, our emotion, our thoughts, all of this, get this out of the way so that the Spirit of God can function and motivate through our lives, our thoughts, our hearts, and our minds. Yes, it's easy to speak in tongues because you don't know what you are saying. Come on. Come on. You don't know if it's right or wrong, inside out or upside down, or, or you don't know what it is. But when you speak in English, if you're in America, and that prophecy, it could be mixed.
and your intellect can analyze the words before they leave your mouth. Come on. But when you're in the spirit, the spirit of the Lord bypasses your mind and intellect and you speak out of the innermost parts of your being. And there'll be words of prophecy that will almost tear your insides out of you. And there'll be prophecies it will feel like you are bringing forth a birthing within your being. Now, beloved, that is what God is looking for. It's not flipping off the handle when you get an anointing, but waiting for the empowerment, the endowment of that divine, divine, divine anointing of God. And when God speaks, even the birds, if they were here, would hush their singing. So just because you have received the gift of prophecy, you have not received the ultimate, you have received the beginning. And why is it we always love the beginning? You know why? It gratifies the flesh and makes the person feel good. But God wants to take us out of the soulish realm to live in life, live in spirit. Then, like I said, no matter what ministry you've got, There'll be a birthing, a fruitation, and a changing of lives, even if it is in you. And no ministry is any good unless it's doing something in you. Number one. Amen. No ministry is any good until first it works in you. Amen? And if it doesn't work in you, it's yourself. Metal again. Revelation 19.10. Anybody time conscious tonight? And I fell at his feet to worship him. And he said unto me, See thou do it not, I am thy fellow servant, and of thy brethren that have, what? The testimony of Jesus. Worship God, for the testimony of Jesus is what? Did you know what you read? If you don't know what you read, read it over again. You see how we've been buffaloed? It's more than getting up and saying, you know, I love Jesus, everybody, and thank God I'm filled with the Holy Ghost. Amen. That's a testimony, but this is the testimony. So I'm encouraging all you that are desiring to move in the ministry of prophecy or desiring to move in any ministry that you have or will ever get from God, please, by God's grace and submission and discipline, allow God to bring it into maturity. That you won't be a little baby playing with a toy, playing with a toy to get the goosebumps and the ducky bites and all the good feelings and have everybody say, Whoa! Glory, wasn't that wonderful? I want God to speak to me. I want God to bring changes in my life. And I don't care how God does it, but please, God, do something. I want some more. And some more. And some more. And some more. I am not satisfied. I want some more. And you know what that means? 
I've got to give up, surrender, submit, whatever you want to call it. I don't have it all. Hey, I'm not perfect. I'm only forgiven. Some people are so per perfect, they're perfected forever. I don't know why they're not translated. <laughs> All right, back to Acts 19.6. 19.6. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Spirit came on them, and they spoke with tongues and prophesied. And there appears to be a spirit of prophecy <coughs> traveling throughout the land. Amen? There appears to be a spirit of prophecy prevalent throughout the land, but it is not all. Totally God. God is looking for prophets and prophetesses with a purpose and a function in the body of Christ. A true prophet will never fit in to any church structure. Did you hear me? A true prophet of God will never fit in to the church structure. Number one, the church can't afford to have them. Number two, the devil don't want them. And number three, a lot of people will not pay the price to listen. A true prophet, most of the time, will walk totally alone. But, quote, he hears from God. He hears from God. He doesn't have to pick up the Wall Street Journal or watch Walter Cronkite or pick up Time or Newsweek. He knows he hears from God. And how many times have you gone to this one and that one and this one and that one and this one and that one and been prayed over, prayed over, prayed over and prayed over and given up in total disgust and discouragement and out of nowhere a person from obscure obscurity gives you the word of the Lord and you never planned on it. Amen? Amen? Amen. All right. Now, 1 Corinthians 14. Four and five. He that speaketh in an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. Does all prophecy edify the church? How many times have you observed that the prophecy only edified the person that was speaking? What would you do about that? Like everybody else, let it go by. Is that right? Somebody needs some teaching and instruction and encouragement, don't they? Amen? It's to edify the church, not you, to church. I would that ye all spoke with tongues, but rather that ye prophesied 
For greater is he that prophesieth than he that speaketh with tongues, except he interpret that the church may receive edifying. We are told to exhort one another. Amen? Amen. Are we encouraging one another? Something to think about, isn't it? Let's find Romans 12. Six. Thank you. Having then gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us, whether prophecy, let us prophesy, oh dear, according to what? Do you have any more words in that verse? Do you? Do you? Do you? Do you have any more words in that verse? You do? Did you know they were there? Do you know that they mean something? You can only prophesy according to the proportion of grace, anointing, So that takes a lot of the prophecy and shrinks it down pretty small. And you say, why do you say that? I interject. Faith is not only a gift, but it's a fruit. To all is given a measure of what? Faith. And how many of you don't have faith for hardly anything? Oh, I shouldn't say that. Should I? We ought to erase that right off the table. I should say, we all have great faith. Amen? That makes you feel a little bit better, don't it? But who are you fooling? God is interjecting the thought that we need an abundance and abundance and abundance of faith to function in the true ministry of God. In Ephesians, as I shared the other night, according to the power that worketh in us, your ministry of prophecy according to the measure of faith that you have. And if you say, Brother Beasley, I have a lot of faith. I can, I have this, I have great faith. If you do, Brother Richard will take it to Brother Joe tonight and we'll put that faith to work, Brother Richard. We'll challenge that faith in Jesus' name. Amen? We can talk a lot, but when we're put in a position, when we're put in a place of challenge, people begin to take a back step. Amen? So when we begin to function in prophecy, let's make sure that if you feel an, an inadequacy in your prof prophecy, Maybe it could be an inadequacy of receiving the faith that is greatly needed. And the devil will come along and say, see, you blew it. That was you. You really didn't have the it that was needed to be approved by the people. Could it be? You don't have enough faith? 
I'd rather feel I didn't have the faith than have the devil convince me I blew it. Amen. Come on now. I'd rather admit my inadequacy of faith and reach out and say, God, I want more faith. I want more faith. I want more faith. Beloved, than to believe that the devil hounded me and tried to rob from me what God's given me. According to the proportion of faith, people of God, in any true ministry of God, you need an unlimited faith of Jesus Christ. When you pray for the sick, you must believe that they are healed. Amen? And when you pray for somebody that's oppressed or bent out of shape, you must believe that they are free. If you don't, you have no ministry. Then why go to the altar to pray for these people tonight for salvation if you don't believe and have faith? Amen? Don't you have faith that God's going to save them? Don't you believe that God's going to save them? Sure. Then why can't we have faith in believing in God for the ministry that's coming to the body of Jesus Christ? God will give us the grace. God will give us all the faith that we will ever need or want. All you will do is claim it. You know why we have trouble with faith? I shared with somebody today, I guess. Faith functions in three rounds. Negative faith. Passive faith and positive faith, three rounds. And maybe someday I'd love to do teaching on spiritual warfare. I'd love to do that. We'd hear the sound of muskets, we'd hear them wadding the guns, and we'd hear the troops of marching. The body of Jesus Christ is beginning to enter into spiritual warfare in spite of ourselves. In spite of ourselves. Amen? So we need that proportion of faith if we're going to function in the depths of God. Yes, it takes a lot of faith to walk in the office work of a prophet. It sure does. The office work of a prophet demands responsibility. You can push the broom all around Pinecrest all you want to and be happy. That's not my nature. Hey, I'm not looking to be the boss. No way. But I want to amount to something in the kingdom of God. You can be the doorkeeper. You can be the man if you want to. But I think God's calling us to a higher realm than being the doorkeeper and the man. I've had enough people walk all over me down here. <laughs> huh? Amen? Come on now. Aren't you getting sick and tired having people walk all over you? Amen. Well, if you're not, I am. And you know what, people? The proverbial, aesthetic song of the church is when the saints go marching in. Right? And you live in fear. I don't know if I'll make it. I don't know if I'll make it. I hope I'm first. And not a last. I feel sorry if your last name begins with Z. I get a better chance because mine begins with B. <laughs> See, but you know what? I don't care if I'm at the end of the line. Don't worry. I want to move the fence post over when I come in because God promised me abundant entrance into the kingdom of God. I don't want to make it by the skin of my teeth. I want to shove that post over. Because here he comes. I'm not bragging. I'm not telling you. I'm telling you the truth. God has promised us abundance and abundance above all that we could ever ask and think. Then why do we live a starved to death spiritual experience in God? Why? Man, there's something far better than what you and I've got tonight. Hmm? And that should tell you and I, there's more. There's more. There's more. And if you function in the realm of prophecy, there should be such a hunger and such a cry in your heart. The 
that you're not satisfied with just a mediocre, but you want integrity, you want responsibility, you want the faith that when you speak or whatever it is, things will begin to happen. When the prophet spoke, he said a few words, it's not going to rain, period. And he didn't wait around to see if it did or it didn't. Come on. Come on. Then why do you hang around to see what words you say come to pass? Amen. Hmm? And that prophet said it wasn't going to rain. The day came when he said, nation, it's going to rain. And you know what happened? It rained. And if you're not too much interested in the Old Testament, let's take a journey into the New. When Jesus walked up to the fig tree to find something to eat, he found nothing. So he said a few words and passed on. He didn't wait to see if the words was going to take place. On the way back, the disciples said, wow, look what happened. It died. My, that's terrific faith. <laughs> that's fabulous faith. Jesus spoke. I don't care if he cursed a fig tree or not. He spoke a creative word one way or the other. He spoke. It died. And when Jesus stood before Lazarus, he spoke a word. That word created, word brought life. The prophetic ministry speaks words. Do yours? Or should I dare ask this question tonight? I'll ask it, but don't raise your hands. How many of you are functioning in the prophetic realm or feel the leading of the Spirit of the Lord into the prophetic ministry? Think about it. I read that verse, didn't I? Now let's go to 1 Corinthians 13, 8 and 9. Love never faileth, but whether there be prophecies, they shall be done away. Whether there be tongues, they shall cease. Whether there be knowledge, they shall vanish away. For we know in part, and we what? Correct. But so many of them know everything. They know everything. They can even tell you the minute that Jesus is supposed to be coming back or, or going away or, or whatever you want to call it. But God is beginning to birth a true ministry in the body of Jesus Christ. A true ministry, a pure ministry. He's beginning to birth worship and praise. The purity of worship in praise, you can't crank it up. And the time is coming, people, when you start to crank it up, you're going to be all alone cranking. And, you know, I have a CB radio at home, and I've got a little, uh, little extra rigging on it, you know, and when I get out on the airwaves and want to get out someplace, you know, and they say, how you doing? I say, I'm doing pretty good. I got my daughter turning the crank. <laughs> get a little bit of power out, you know. And we're going to begin to find that if it's not the purity of God, you're going to be standing there cranking up yourself because people are beginning to be made aware of the sensitivity of coming into pure worship. 
pure praise, to pure ministry of God. And you can ta-da on your own. It happened back on the days of Pentecost. Paul went around with a whip in one hand, didn't he? And a cruise of healing oil in the other, didn't he? Huh? Come on now, people. We talk about angels, you know, and all the goody, 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 goodies. But I see Paul had a rough road to walk. But I'll tell you, he made him toe the line, didn't he? He made them walk in the integrity of the Holy Ghost. He brought the churches in submission and discipline. He corrected them by sovereign divine leading of the Lord. He stood about against the false prophets. He stood against the gods that were screaming into the churches. He stood for the purity of God's word and God backed them up all the way. He had the power, he had the authority, he had the faith. And when he motivated, he motivated in the ultimate, the infinity of God. You say, no, he didn't. Oh, he did. Because on the epitaph of his tongue, when he was slipping it into the box, he said, I have fought a good fight. I've finished my course. My race on earth is done. And he had the ability and the power to say, Follow me as I follow Christ. What a voice of encouragement and strength. And I'll tell you, if I said that tonight, he's who? Who do you think you are? Come on. Paul said it now, didn't he? Man, we can find it here tonight. And Paul said, I'm your example. People, we've got a lot of work to do. If we're going to be examples, amen? Okay, First Thessalonians. Five twenty. I got to stop. Despise not prophesying, but prove all things and hold fast that which is good. Is our prophecy good? It should be. And when people jump up and down like popcorn on a hot stove and prophesy 5, 10, 15, 20 times, I take inventory. And I begin to question and I begin to think because I don't think God's a toy. And above all else, the impartation of the ministry of the Holy Ghost is not to make you an entertainer. It's to minister to the body of Jesus Christ. Amen. I love what I'm picking up. And I'm not just picking up pages in my Bible. <clears throat> Acts 3, 22. For Moses truly said unto the fathers, a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like unto me. Him shall ye hear in all things whatever he shall say unto you. Moses was quite a prophet. But he was a tremendous leader. Wasn't he? Acts 7. 37. This is that Moses who said unto the children of Israel, 
a prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren like me, him shall ye hear. And over another place in an Old Testament, it speaks, I cannot find it because I don't have my other Bible. And the end of the verses was that they will know that a prophet hath been in their midst. And I cannot think of it. It's one of the prophetic books. But they will say that they have known that a prophet hath been in their midst. Let's pray to God tonight that we won't get in that condition of, of apostasy and derision and confusion. And then after the Spirit of God has left, we will say, Jesus was here. Jesus is here to bless, to strengthen, to encourage. Okay? The purpose and function of a prophet. Here's some words that you will like. Edification. Number two, exhortation. Number three, comfort. You still with me? Keep smiling. For instruction. Still with me? Direction. Are you with me? For correction. You still with me? I'm losing some of you. What did the prophet Samuel say to King Saul? You know what he did? He pronounced judgment. Didn't he? Huh? I can't hear you. What did he do? He told King Saul, if you don't do this, and you don't do this, and you don't do this, here's what will happen to you. Come on. Right? Come on. You should know more about the Bible than I do. And what did Nathan tell David? He brought stern correction to King David, didn't he? So I don't care how you categorize and handle words. The ministry of prophecy is a tremendous asset to the body of Jesus Christ. And God is raising up a prophetic unction, anointing, and ministry, and let's pray that we get a hold of the reality of this ministry and don't be satisfied with second or third best. Amen? I want God's ultimate best. A prophet should discern Anybody on the little man's side now? The prophet should function in the gift of healing. He should function in wisdom and knowledge. Anybody with me tonight or am I all by myself? The true prophet of God will speak words of wisdom, words of knowledge, words of correction, words of instruction, words of direction. And they should be able to discern. We like to use the word sense and feel. I can't see that in the true ministry of Jesus Christ. We don't go by sense and feel. We go by the spirit. Life functions in the spirit. Feelings and senses function in the carnal, natural realm. Let's get out of the natural. Let's get out of the carnal and begin to flow in the anointing of the Holy Ghost. I don't care if you speak in tongues. Make sure that it's under the anointing and direction of the Holy Ghost. Anybody say amen tonight? Amen. 
And when the Spirit of the Lord comes upon you to interpret the message of interpretation, make sure you're flowing under the anointing and the direction of the Holy Ghost. Otherwise, there's a grating and crossing of the grain. Have you ever noticed it? And how many times have you noticed prophecy flow directly against the anointing of the service? Directly against it. If that's the story, that person should be encouraged. Go into an office, sit down, have a talk, teach, correct, encourage, and instruct so that the ministry can come into the free flow of the Spirit of God. Bring self under, bring the feeling and the emotions under submission and subjection to the Holy Ghost. Then we'll see the purity of God begin to flow and function. Our beloved, just because you get up and do cartwheels and shiver and shake, that's not always the anointing. I heard over here, just a little rumble. It isn't. Show me in the Word. Show me in the Word. I believe it. I could never see Jesus shaking, going all over the place. Could you? And he had all power, all authority, all dominion. He had it all. And my God, if he ever shook like some people, he'd have lost his head along the Damascus Road. <laughs> he functioned in the integrity of the Holy Spirit. And we, as a body of Christ, let's set our feelings, our flesh, our ambitions, our desires, let's cast them aside, those little weights that death, so, uh, that death so easily beset us. Let's scrape them off, let's wash them aside, and let's get rid of these things, and don't get off your face, my God, people, until you've heard from God yourself. Don't get off your face until you've heard from God yourself. And when you've heard from God yourself, the purity and the revelation of Jesus Christ will transform your life, your mind, your spirit, and your being. And when you begin to move, people will pay attention. Yeah. They'll stand up like ten pins when you walk by. They'll say, I don't know what that person's got, but my. He's got something. I want it. When I read this word and I see what Jesus does and Jesus did, I'm a candidate for this. He, I'm not interested in walking on the water. I'm not even interested in speaking to a Lazarus. I'm not even interested in turning 120 gallons of water into water. I got all I can do to keep my ship on an even keel. How about you? Huh? When we begin to flow in the spirit, no matter what storm crosses our pathway, Amen. no matter how high the waves may roll and the lightning flashes and the thunder rolls, he, the captain of the Lord of hosts, will be at the helm of my little ship. I won't need a compass or a charge. I'll look to the captain of my salvation and I'll say, sir, you rolled to sea once before and you made it. Take me through. Hallelujah. Take me through. Hallelujah. Oh, you get the vision and touch God for ourselves and see the holiness of God. We let a lot of these things just fall off of us. It's just like when you're grimy and dirty, how you love to get in the shower and wash all the dirt go down the drain. Well, when you begin to flow in the spirit and have a revelation and see Jesus, honey, you're washed. You're a different person. 
And God is raising up a prophetic ministry, but it's pure. It's pure. And they don't always shiver and shake and do cartwheels. But when God speaks, 250 gallons of water on this floor tonight would make quite a mess here, wouldn't it? It sure would. When God speaks, people, it'd be just like God dumping 250 gallons of water on this floor tonight. You'll never forget it. If this place flooded to your knees, you'd never forget it. Well, I believe when the purity of the ministry of the Holy Ghost begins to move, I don't care if it's a prophetic realm or anything, people are going to be touched and their lives will be changed for an eternal work of glory in the lives and hearts of men. Hallelujah. Are you with me tonight? So, I shared with you quite a lot, and maybe sometime, I might share again. Amen. But I feel, let's not get caught up in prophecy. Let's get caught up in God. Don't get caught up in miracles. Get caught up in the worker of the miracles. Don't get caught up in tongues. Get caught up in the giver. Amen? Don't seek gifts, seek the giver. All of these gifts are beautiful, but they're not an end in themselves. They're the threshold into the unlimited resources of power, grandeur, and glory in God. There's no limit in God. There's no failure in God. If you want faith, seek it. If you're not happy with the amount of ministry that you've got, seek for direction, seek for the faith and instruction and grace of God, and God will never let you down. Amen. And can I tell you something else? There'll be times in your life, people, when God will put the ministry on the shelf. See, like I take this eraser and I put it there. There are times when God will put your ministry on the shelf for a reason. To see how you hang in there when you ain't doing your thing. And when all the people aren't around you looking for something, and then when you begin to walk that valley or the backside of that desert, oh, God, don't I wish I was doing this. Oh, God, don't I wish I was back there. If you go on with God, you won't pick up that ministry, but you could pick up something else on the way. And guaranteed, if you pay the price, that ministry, when you pick it up, will have a greater impact, greater impartation, and a greater input. Come on. And this is what God is doing. Let's not be satisfied with what we have tonight. Let's cry out to God, God, I want some more. I hope I've created a soul-searching condition tonight a soul searching condition of God that you would cry out unto your heart before God and say, God, I want some more. I want some more. I want some more. I don't intend to be negative in my expressions tonight, but I try to encourage you to not be satisfied with what you've got, but begin to launch out. Say, set aside those things that hinder you. Cast away those things that trouble you and begin to flow into the purity. And I'm not saying you're not, but let's not be satisfied with the beginning. Let's really launch out. And you know what? The enemy don't want you to launch out. But just like Brother Finn says, you know what to do to him. Say, oh, I know what to do with him. I don't have any problem with that. So let's really give God all we've got. He gave us everything. 
And you know what, people? When you came to Jesus for salvation, he took you at your word. He trusted you. He believed you. He never called you a liar. Now, did he? He took you at your word. Now, I challenge you. Will you take God at his word? Will you believe his word? If he could take you and believe you, bent out of shape and full of lot of you know what, if he could believe you and have faith in you and trust you, now God is saying, will you trust me? Will you trust me? Let's not have a hassle. Let's not question. Let's, by the simplicity of faith in Jesus Christ, say, Lord, I believe. You said it in your word. I believe it. And now God, by faith, and by the anointing of the Holy Ghost, I'm going to walk in what you've given me. And you know what? God will never stop giving, 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 giving. You will never outgive God anyway. And he'll pour it on as quick as you can handle it. And he just won't pour it on. He'll let it flow all over you. He'll step on it, press it in, and keep pouring it on. That's what that Psalmist David said in the 23rd Psalm. See? So you know what? God's not stingy. He's not stingy. So I hope I've encouraged some of you people tonight. I really hope I have. Stirred you up a little bit? Perhaps may have answered some of your questions? And perhaps creating a spirit of really reaching out for God's best. You know, I don't have God's best. I want it. I'm striving for it. And someday, I will attain unto it. But I know what I have tonight is not all that I want. Once in a while, I have it up to here, though. You know, I do have it up to here once in a while. And I say, okay, God, back off. I want a break. So I have about two or three days coffee break, and I said, boy, isn't this beautiful? You know, no hassle, no difficulty, no problems. And then I start to get nervous. What's wrong? <laughs> What's wrong? <laughs> you know, if you're really in God, if it gets too quiet, you get concerned. Come on now. You get concerned if it gets too quiet. See? Maybe you're too far behind the lines. <laughs> if you're too far behind the lines, say, God, I want front and center. It takes a man to be a spearhead. But God's raising men. So people, in closing tonight, you that God is beginning to lead into the prophetic ministry or into the ministry that you feel that the Lord is leading you into. How many of you want more? How many of you want it to become matured? That you'll bring fruit. That your fruit will remain. There'll be always something there to feed somebody else. Always there to give somebody else. Now, if you're honest with God, people, tonight you can have it. Tonight. And I'll share something else. The more spiritual you are, the more humble you will be. The more you'll be conscious of you need some more. You need some more. You need some more. The more spiritual you are, the more broken and contrite you will be. You'll never walk around with a spiritual ear. You'll never walk around and feel that you're above the people and you can't even shake your hand or talk to them. I know a minister that has bodyguards. He gets six hundred dollars a week and he speaks two hours a week. Has a sunken swimming pool in his home and has two royal voices in his yard and everything he wants. 
And when he gets done preaching, these six men gather around him and he never touches anybody's hand. You call him up on the telephone, it's either a tape recorder or different people answer the phone. You never talk to him. Hey, if that's God, I don't want it. And he has thousands and thousands and thousands of followers. And every time I see Jesus, I see him around the sheep, caressing them, loving them, talking to them. He walks up to that little lamb and puts his finger on its nose. And if it's nice and cool and sweaty, you're all right, honey. You're doing fine. And he walks over, this sheep's got a, dry, a, a hot, dry nose. S something's wrong. Something's wrong. Maybe you and I ought to have a talk. And that sheep would say, I ain't going to talk to you. I want nothing to do with you. Jesus says, OK, honey, but you and I are going to get together under adverse circumstances. <laughs> Come on. And so he just takes that old staff and sees that stubborn, rebellious one. He says, I've got news for you today. You are going to listen. And he breaks his leg. And then he reaches down and he says, honey, didn't I tell you I want to love you a little bit? I want you and I to get on talking terms because I love you. And by the time that leg is healed, that sheep will never say no to Jesus again. Amen. He'll be Jesus will be falling all over him. You know why? Because that sheep's going to make sure he isn't going to make any more mistakes. Amen? That's Jesus tonight. So all you that really want the fullness or the maturity of the gift that you have in prophecy or whatever, would you please come up front? Now we know that God is no respecter of persons. Let's come right on in. Come on in. Hey, you know, if that water was trouble, you'd never stay out back. You'd be jumping over everybody to get in. Amen? And you know what, people? Jesus is taking you at your word tonight as you come up front here. You're not doing anything for me. You're doing it because you want something from God tonight. And the little man can't give you a thing. It's you look to God. You look God for the, for the maturity of your ministry. You look to God for the maturity uh, of whatever the Lord desires to bring into fruitation in your life. You look to God tonight that God will take you out of that realm that you are in into the depths of God into the fullness of God. I hope tonight every one of you that's here tonight is not satisfied of where you are in the ministry of Jesus Christ. I'm not talking about deliverance tonight. I'm not interested in that tonight. I'm interested that you get God's best. That you're willing to set emotion aside, feeling aside, ducky bites aside, goosebumps aside, all these things, emotions, that you're willing to set them aside and say, God, I'm not satisfied. I want the fullness of the ministry of the Holy Ghost in my life. Amen? You with me tonight? Okay, if you believe God tonight, I want you to raise both of your hands. Calisthenic class. Let's see it. Now I want you to really bring God with me. I want you to really sing God tonight. I'm not looking for screaming and yelling and hollering, but I want you to begin to pour your heart out to God right now. Come on. Ask God right now in Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, ask God right now. Right now, I know that God will empower you what you need tonight.
for these people tonight. The faith that can move the mountains. The faith that can move the but it will be the purity of the Holy Ghost. Thank you, Jesus. The purity of the Holy Ghost. The incarnate Word of God birthing love in the body of Jesus Christ. The breath of God breathing life, renewing strength and hope in the body of Jesus Christ. God, we just don't want a normal gift. We want the gift of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God, we want to give us the Holy Ghost. We want the manifestation of the giving of the gifts in our lives. We're not satisfied with the ordinary. We're not just satisfied with Pentecost. We want the fire, the anointing, and the doing of Pentecost. Fire burning, consuming, and birthing life. I speak it into creation. I speak the words within the spirit of these people tonight. Bypass the intellect, bypass the mind, and drop it into the spirit. The spirit of God. I speak into action and into manifestation tonight. 
Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus.